Brothers and sisters, welcome. So glad to be with you tonight. Uh, my name is Spencer Fluman, and I'm the executive director of the Neil A. Maxwell Institute for Religious Scholarship at BYU. And uh, very glad to welcome you all here uh, this evening. This is not an official event of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but we're in a Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. We're very grateful to President Christensen of the Cambridge Stake in Massachusetts uh, for uh, a, a welcome here to hold this Maxwell Institute event, kind of on location in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Glad to have you all here and glad to welcome those who are participating via our live feed YouTube audience. Uh, glad to welcome all of you to watching wherever you're at. Um, the Maxwell Institute is a research uh, community based at BYU uh, that focuses on religious scholarship and religious topics. And so we come with a, with a mission to both uh, speak the language of academic work and to translate that academic work for very smart but perhaps non-academic Latter-day Saints, like some of you. And that's our, that's our mission, is to connect uh, religious scholarship with Latter-day Saints in an effort to inspire and, uh, and fortify all of us. We invite you to learn more about the Maxwell Institute by visiting our website, mi.byu.edu, uh, or follow us on uh, social media, um, sign up for a monthly newsletter if you'd like. But we, we like to put our scholarly voices um, I would like to connect them to Latter-day Saints everywhere who are um, seeking that uh, life of the soul and life of the mind intersection. And so if that describes you, we're, we're glad to have you along for the ride. Uh, this is the fourth of four um, events of this kind. The other three were in Provo, Utah, but this is the fourth where we are introducing um, authors of a 12-volume series on Book of Mormon theology to Latter-day Saint audiences. I'll describe after an opening prayer exactly why we're doing it this way, uh, but we would like to begin with a, a word of prayer before we, before we get started in earnest. And I've invited Muhammad Hassan uh, to come and offer an opening prayer for us. Over the summer, he was a scholar of residence with us at the Maxwell Institute. We count him as one of our own, but uh, he, uh, he is right now living in this area. So, Muhammad, thank you. Our most kind and gracious Father in heaven, Thank you so much for this beautiful Sabbath day, and thank you for giving us all the opportunity to come here and listen to these scholars. Please bless us that we may learn from their knowledge and from their wisdom. Please bless us that we may learn and also apply their knowledge and wisdom to better the world and thy kingdom. And please bless this the scholars and speakers today that they may be able to share their knowledge and their wisdom and that they may have thy spirit and that they may be inspired um, to better thy kingdom and the world through their knowledge and wisdom. We thank thee and we love thy gospel so very much and humbly say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. On our YouTube channel, you can see archived there the three previous events. Um, we're basically taking in these events, we're, at, we're asking are the authors of these volumes treating the theology of the Book of Mormon, basically one author per book of the Book of Mormon, to, uh, to share a kind of uh, working set of ideas that they're working through as they're crafting these volumes. And we wanted to get in close proximity uh, to Latter-day Saint uh, listeners 
uh, to engage with our authors. And so you've been provided a um, note card, uh, something to write with. And we invite you to keep track of questions you have. We'll have a, a Q&A at the end here where you can uh, ask your questions to the authors and engage with them. All of this is in an effort to help our authors. They're all brilliant. And uh, we want them to be brilliant and accessible to non-academic uh, readers. And so this, uh, this is a kind of workshop. Thank you for coming to the workshop. You're going to help our authors be able to communicate more effectively with, uh, with, with the Latter-day Saints who uh, are seeking in the Book of Mormon both insight and inspiration both. And so we're looking at the intersection of mind and heart here. A little something from Elder Maxwell to kind of set us up for um, a series like the one we're pursuing. This is uh, our namesake for our research institute, uh, but memorably about the Book of Mormon. Quote, there is so much more in the Book of Mormon than we have yet discovered. The book's divine architecture and rich furnishings will increasingly unfold to our view, further qualifying it as a marvelous work and a wonder. So we're interested in that kind of continuing discovery of the riches that are there in the scriptural text. And so that's what we're after tonight. Um, I'm going to introduce all three of our speakers. They are, uh, they're all wonderful friends and wonderful minds and uh, wonderful saints uh, to boot. And so we're grateful we'll hear first from Dr. Adam Miller, who comes to us from Collin College in Texas. And he's writing on the Book of Mormon, not the whole book, but Mormon's book. He'll be followed by Rosalind Wells. She's an independent scholar coming to us from the great state of Missouri. And uh, she's writing on Ether and will present to us on that volume. And then lastly, uh, David Holland, who is either Dr. Holland or President Holland uh, around these parts, depending on which office you're in, I guess. Uh, but he'll he'll be our concluding speaker, and he's writing on the Book of Moroni. Uh, and then once uh, once President Holland concludes, then we'll um, take some time to collect your questions, and then I'll feed the questions to our authors. And we'll go till about eight thirty or so is our is our goal, uh, and then we'll conclude. So, uh, Dr. Miller. evening. Thanks for coming. My brief was to write about Mormon in the Book of Mormon. The Book of Mormon in the Book of Mormon, which turned out to be surprisingly hard to explain to people <laughs> what I was writing about. Uh, if my book were allowed to have a subtitle, which I expect it won't, uh, <laughs> the, the subtitle of the book would be uh, Mormon a Beginner's Guide to the End of the World. <laughs> I think in terms of market research, that's, that's a pretty positive response. <laughs> uh, I'm going to work here mostly from uh, 30,000 feet to give you a feel for what I'm aiming to do in the project and the basic point I want to make. Uh, and for the details, you're going to have to buy the book. <laughs> It's commonly said that Latter-day Saints don't do theology. Our tradition doesn't have theologians, only historians. As Jan Schiff's put it, quote, I heard the assertion that Mormonism does not have a theology, it has a history so often that it seemed to be the mantra of the LDS intellectual community. Against this backdrop, the Maxwell Institute's forthcoming series of brief theological introductions to the Book of Mormon is an act of scholarly rebellion. This series as a whole can't help but land as a provocation to those who claim the business of thinking about or even defending our faith must be managed by historians and conducted fundamentally in the past tense. In defiance of this mantra, I want to claim that if there has ever been a religious tradition that cannot be reduced to its history and that must be addressed and defended in the present tense, it is our own. 
adapting a line from Ralph Waldo Emerson's 1838 barn burner of an address at Harvard's Divinity School, an address delivered just down the road, an address that got him banned from speaking at the Divinity School for the next 30 years. I want to insist that, quote, it is the office of a true theologian to show us that God is, not was, that he speaks, not spake. I want to insist, as Emerson does, that the capital secret of the theologian's profession is to convert life into truth by passing life through the fire of thought. It's in this same Emersonian spirit that this series of brief theological introductions intends, as its own vision statement puts it, to seek Christ in scripture by combining intellectual rigor and the disciples' yearning for holiness. I take this vision statement at its word. This series of books is not an exercise in academic self-congratulation. Rather, sharpened by the wet stone of intellectual rigor, the theologian's urgent work is driven instead by a yearning for holiness, by a burning hunger for Christ himself. This hunger will not be satisfied with history alone. It will not be satisfied with amassing residual evidence of a historical Christ or with collecting faint traces of a divinity that luckily survived the erosion of those bygone worlds. The theologian, while taking history seriously, is not looking for the historical Christ. The theologian, resolutely insisting that we speak in the present tense, is searching for the living Christ. On this model, theology is not about history or doctrine. Histories and doctrines, rather than being the goal, only comprise the theologian's raw materials. The theologian sets out in search of Christ. To proceed otherwise is to risk displacing Christ from the center of our faith. When scholars or even apologists insist that historical questions must always take priority over theological questions, they risk insisting that Christ can only be approached as an artifact. They risk privileging a husk of godliness while denying the power thereof. They risk handcuffing Christ to the thin and fundamentally secular horizons of what can be historically verified. They risk, in short, bracketing Christ. Theology, on my account, is a principled refusal to bracket Christ. The theologian's job is to see the substance of a first-person, present-tense life lived in Christ converted into truth by passing that experience through the fire of thought. As a theologian, my working interest in the histories and doctrines embedded in Scripture must be consistently supervened by the job of extracting from these raw materials a profile that brings Christ into sharp focus as alive power. Working in the present tense, the same fundamental question must be returned to again and again. How, in the details of this canonical text, is the ongoing reality of Christ's redemptive power confirmed and revealed? Exactly how, in Christ, are we saved? In reading and rereading Mormon's own book in the Book of Mormon, I asked myself this question again and again. The Christological profile that gradually emerged in response was both harrowing and redemptive. If you've finished reading the Book of Mormon recently, you will be aware that Mormon is a terror and about what happens when we run out of time. Mormon is a book about a man who lives through the end of the world. He loses everything and everyone he loves. His world literally collapses around him socially, politically, economically, ecologically, religiously. He's forced to watch as his people's cities are destroyed, as their lands are burned, as their women and children are sacrificed to idols, and as hundreds of thousands of corpses pile up. Mormon, with his, wide, with his eyes wide open, sees, as Hugh Nibley put it, all life and stuff about him, involved in a huge, ceaseless a literal and apparent process of oxidation, which is turning some things slowly, some rapidly, but all things surely, to ashes. What can we learn from Mormon's experience? As a theologian, my intention is to read Mormon's book as a beginner's guide to the end of the world. 
I intend to read it as a case study in a public discipleship. My basic question is this. What does Christian discipleship look like when you are not just waiting for the end of the world, but actually living through it? My wager is that Mormon's apocalyptic, apocalyptic discipleship can bring more clearly into view the underlying structure of discipleship itself. In particular, I'm betting on the following thesis, that living through the end of the world on any number of scales is the fundamental framework for Christian discipleship of any kind, by anyone, in any world, in any age. To help bring this into focus, imagine some combination of the following scenarios. Imagine, on the one hand, a certain kind of religion. Imagine a religion that required you to lose your life to save it. Imagine a religion whose introductory ritual required you to symbolically die, be buried, and then rise from the grave, committed now to living what remained of your life as something that belonged not to you, but to God, bearing his name, filled with his spirit, acting as his agent. Imagine a religion that might at any time ask you, as Jesus did the rich young man, to sell all that thou hast and distribute unto the poor. Imagine a religion premised on the necessity of sacrificing all things, a religion that claimed up front, as the lectures on faith do, that any religion that does not require the sacrifice of all things never has power sufficient to produce the faith necessary unto life and salvation. Or imagine, finally, a religion that explicitly required you to return to God by way of consecration, all of your time, all of your talents, and all of your possessions. Can you imagine this sort of religion? Can you imagine a religion that required the sacrifice of all things? Now imagine, on the other hand, a certain kind of world. Imagine a world structured by time and pinned to its relentless flow. Imagine a world where everything that arises will also pass away. A world where, as Joseph Smith claimed, as the Lord liveth, if it had a beginning, it will have an end. Imagine a world where possessions decay, buildings crumble, triumphs fade, governments collapse, continents drift, and mass extinctions happen again and again. Imagine a world where children grow up and leave home, where people get sick and grow old, where everyone dies. Imagine a world where the people you love for as long as they live, for better or worse, are constantly changing. In this kind of world, people are more like rivers than rocks. They persist, but never stay the same. Imagine this kind of marriage, this kind of family, this kind of home. This isn't hard to do. My grandparents are dead. My father can no longer walk. The young man my wife married is gone forever. <laughs> Our daughter is already grown. The five-year-old girl I held in my lap is never coming back. The 12-year-old girl I took to the movies is never coming back. The 19-year-old girl I dropped off at college is never coming back. Does this perpetual passing away hurt? Shouldn't it? Resurrection doesn't solve this problem. Immortality doesn't solve this problem. Resurrection doesn't freeze the world in place, trapping us in a block of ice-cold perfection. Resurrection is the promise that in Christ, life can continue to pass, not that it will finally stop passing. Imagine then a world where you are guaranteed to lose everything and everyone. Imagine a world where it is always possible to care for things, but never possible to keep them. Now, to press on the urgent contemporary reality of such a world, and perhaps the urgent contemporary reality, uh, contemporary relevance of the Book of Mormon, take what we've imagined thus far and push it a step farther. Imagine that these are actually the latter days. 
imagine that the world itself is going to end, that the earth shall be rolled together as a scroll and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Imagine a world that could end tomorrow in nuclear winter and a cloudburst of ballistic missiles and blast radii and poisonous fallout. Or imagine one single bomb that all by itself would be powerful enough to ruin the world and render it uninhabitable. Imagine that bomb going off instantaneously. Now imagine that bomb's detonation requiring a five-minute countdown, a 24-hour countdown, a month-long countdown, a year-long countdown. Imagine even a world-ending bomb with a fuse the length of an average human life. When the baby is born, the fuse is lit. A fuse long enough for their quote to be great doubtings and disputations among the people, notwithstanding so many signs had been given. In this same vein, imagine finally that you lived in a world where we had already accidentally lit the fuse of this sort of world ending bomb back in the 1950s. That we had collectively realized this fuse was burning in the 1980s that we could have largely diffused the bomb any time up through the 2010s, and that now, given our stupor, this bomb was more or less guaranteed to detonate in slow motion over the span of the next hundred years, bringing about the political, economic, and the ecological collapse of the modern world. If you need help imagining the details of this final chilling scenario, you need only consult the latest soul-crushing report issued by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. We are, as a planet, literally sitting atop this sort of world-ending carbon bomb, and we are likely already past the point of diffusing it. In objectively measurable ways, this bomb has already begun to detonate. Still, let's set this last scenario aside for a moment. Regardless of how the world ends, we can rest assured that it is going to end. And regardless of how we lose everything and everyone we love, we will lose them, if only by the most quiet, familiar, and local means. Slowly and singly or swiftly and collectively, death will claim every one of us. As the psalmist says, a person's life is like grass, like a flower in the field that flourishes, but when the hot wind blows by, it disappears, and one can no longer even spot the place where it once grew. Time will dispossess us all. Now recall the point of my asking you to imagine these troubling things. My thesis, as I indicated before, is that a life of Christian discipleship sits squarely at the crossroads of just this sort of religion and just this sort of world. Discipleship happens at the intersection of the requirement that we sacrifice all things and the inevitability of losing all things. As a result, to imagine a life of Christian discipleship, you need only imagine the religion that requires you to sacrifice everything in a world that will, regardless, exact the loss of everything. Imagine then, treading the path of discipleship and doing the following. Imagine preemptively willing as an act of love and sacrifice your own already inevitable loss of all things. Imagine the practice of your religion as the business of willing the end of the world. What would it look like to willingly give up your life and loved ones and world? What would it look like to give them up and then keep loving them? and living with them and caring for them? What would it look like to sacrifice all things intentionally rather than just inevitably? How would it change your relationship to life? How would it change your relationship to property? How would it change your relationship to your parents, your spouse, your children? And how in particular would this sacrificial gesture utterly transform your relationship to time? What would it look like to be a disciple of Christ as the world collapses around you? What does discipleship look like at the end of the world? It looks, I think, like Mormon.
so awkward um, to be in a church where typically we would applaud in the academic setting, but it feels a little strange here um, in a chapel. Yet at the same time, we're not presenting talks, so it's, it's a little awkward. So um, years ago, I started out my career as a Shakespeare scholar. And among the corpus of Shakespeare plays, you have the tragedies, the comedies, the histories. And then you have that set of plays that are known as the problem plays. And these plays are a problem for a couple of reasons. Mostly, they're a problem for critics because we don't know how to classify them. But they're also called problem plays because they set out um, in the protagonist an urgent problem that has kind of exemplary um, relevance to the contemporary society. So I, um, and, and it often has this very dark and kind of ambiguous mood that's difficult to uh, describe. So the Book of Ether, I would suggest, is Moroni's problem scripture. It has a, a complex and dark mood. It presents a stark theological problem with urgent relevance to contemporary audiences. And it's difficult to a problem scripture then, here is the problem that Moroni tackles. Can non-Israelites be saved under the atonement of Jesus Christ as set out in Nephite Christianity? And if so, then on what basis? So Nephi and Mormon and the whole Nephite theological tradition had carefully worked out a covenant theology of salvation based in the Abrahamic covenant and the law of Moses, which points towards and typifies Christ. So Moroni has inherited this tradition, and he now wants to test its scope. Is salvation in Christ truly universal? Nephi prophets taught that the atonement is temporally universal, right? That it's um, efficacious and enforced through all time because Christ is the lamb who was slain from the foundation of the world. And furthermore, Nephi had seen in vision and it was later reiterated by Christ himself in his ministry among the Nephites, that the Gentiles will play a central role in the worldwide drama of salvation. But they haven't worked out a formal theological principle for the salvation of those not of the house of Israel, those outside the covenant. And so this is Moroni's problem, and this is his project in the book of Ether. So why is this question on his mind? Well, partly because Moroni's prophetic mission is directed primarily at the modern Gentiles. His world, as Adam just um, showed us, his world has ended. He has no community. He has no interpretive community. So his message is not to his community, but to the future Gentiles. So he's thinking about them. How can they be saved? They be saved? Um, and, and, and if so, how? They're not Nephites. They're not covered by the covenant. So the, the Jaredites also, crucially, are a non-Israelite people, just like the Gentiles. So it provides opportunity to work out this question of extra-covenantal salvation. Now, maybe this theological problem is sounding familiar to you. After all, as a community, we are reading the epistles of Paul this year, right at this very moment. And Paul is working on that very same problem. Is salvation in Christ available to the Gentiles? And if so, on what basis? How? How does it work? So if you've been paying attention in your gospel doctrine class, you already know Moroni's answer, what he comes to. Faith is the solution that Moroni lights upon. Salvation is available to all covenant insiders and covenant outsiders through faith, which becomes the new medium of our relationship to God. This is Paul's solution to the problem, which he develops in a reading of the story of Abraham in Romans 4, as you remember. And it is Moroni's teaching as well, which he develops in his reading of the story of the brother of Jared who exercises greater faith than any man, we're told, and thus calls down the presence of Christ himself. Despite being, as a Jaredite, who left um, the old world at the Tower of Babel, thus outside the covenant, outside the law of Moses, outside even any Christian tradition. If faith can save the brother of Jared, then faith can save anybody, including the modern Gentiles. And Moroni urgently wants to convey the promise of salvation by faith to Gentile readers of the Book of Mormon. And so how does he do this? 
how does he, in reading the Jaredite record, how does he develop this theology of salvation? So he does it through this complex historical analogy between three groups, the Jaredites, the Nephites, and the modern Gentiles. Groups are separated by time, but they're united by occupying the same geographical place. So Moroni integrates the principle of faith into this grand, dramatic narrative of world salvation that both Nephi in 1 Nephi 13 and later on Christ himself and his personal ministry have set out. So here's how Moroni sees it working. Each of these three groups is given a particular text or a text-like object, which becomes the object of their faith. For the Jaredites, collectively represented in the brother of Jared, it is the 16 stones. And you'll see in a moment why I call that text-like. For the Nephites, of course, it's the prophetic tradition um, of Christ's coming. And for the modern Gentiles, it is the Book of Mormon itself. So if each group faithfully receives the text that is given to them, they in turn call forth the presence of Jesus Christ, and that becomes the means by which they are saved. So for the Jaredites, this occurs in the brother of Jared's theophany, his encounter with God, um, with the pre-mortal Christ. Um, you'll recall that Jesus says to him at that moment, because you know these things, you are redeemed from the fall and brought back into my presence. For the Nephites, their, the faith of the righteous Nephites in the prophetic traditions um, allows the personal ministry of the recently mortal Christ. So we have the pre-mortal Christ, we have the very recently mortal Christ visiting the Nephites. And for the Gentiles, if they receive the Book of Mormon faithfully, they will call forth the second coming or the post-mortal visitation of Jesus Christ to the world. So this is Nephi's large-scale vision of the salvation of the world, which he works out in his careful reading and redaction of the book of Ether, and faith is at the center of this. So this idea solves the problem of the salvation of non-covenant peoples, but it poses another huge secondary problem. And Spoiler alert, right? It doesn't work out for the Jaredites or for the Nephites. Despite the fact that some of their number exercise sufficient faith to catalyze the visitation of Jesus, both of those groups ultimately fail to receive and respond to the Christ event that was given to them. They were destroyed and they were lost because their faith failed them. So if the same thing happens with the Gentiles, if the modern Gentiles that's us, if we fail to receive the Book of Mormon faithfully, not only is our salvation and the salvation of the remnant of Israel, whom we are destined to lead as nursing fathers and mothers, not only is that at stake, but the very second coming of Jesus Christ is in jeopardy. So for Moroni, the stakes are very, very high that modern Gentiles receive the Book of Mormon with faith. So this causes Moroni untold anxiety. He agonizes over this. He obsesses over the moment when his work finds its way into the hands of modern readers. When they open that book, what is going to happen? Will the modern Gentiles receive it with faith? Will they recognize it as scripture? Will they find Christ in it? He also imagines other scenarios where they mock it, they reject it. They denounce it. It fails as scripture, and the salvation of the world fails as well because of that. So sometimes he worries about this as a problem that he has to solve with his own writing methods, right? How does he transform his writing, which is weak, he tells us, which is flawed, made by flawed mortal hands? How does he transform these weak things into scripture that burns with the witness of Christ? sufficient to inspire world-saving faith. He brings this problem to the Lord. He plays this moment of reception over again and again in his mind, and he exhorts, we might even say he harangues the, his modern Gentile readers with this almost desperate urgency that they receive these things as scripture. So much depends on it. So Moroni is wrestling with the problem that we might call scripturalization, right? This complex process by which a new text is invested with 
community authority, and the sacred authority of scripture. So this is a theme in the Book of Mormon itself, right? How does te new text become scripture? Can that happen? It was a burning question in the 19th century American context into which the Book of Mormon came forth. And it also happens at this moment to be an area of intense interest in religious studies over the past few years. And scholars have explored various strategies that authors will use um, in order to bring the authority of the Bible into their writing. And some of their findings are relevant to Moroni's project. But in the end, I think Moroni offers a very different and novel solution to this secondary problem of scripturalization. The key is faith in the Book of Mormon, but how does his writings become scripture? So I think, again, he finds his answer in the story of the brother of Jared. And to conclude, I'm going to offer a particular reading of that story. So throughout the last three books of the Book of Mormon, where the narrative voices of Mormon and Moroni are the most present, we see this particular phrase that appears again and again. And the phrase is, these things, these things. You can, you can search it on your phone right now if you want. The word, the word things is an interesting and important one in the Book of Mormon. Sort of by, by way of evidence for that, um, it is the fifth most common noun in the Book of Mormon things is. This is almost double the frequency of the word's appearance in the King James Bible. Actually, it's more than double the frequency of the word's appearance in the King James Bible, which is kind of our closest linguistic match to the, to the Book of Mormon. In the Bible, it is the 13th most common noun. And both of those are significantly higher than its frequency in the English language at large. So something is going on with the word things in the Book of Mormon. And these things in particular crops up all the time from Mormon and Moroni. And we begin to sense that despite the fact that this is a very ordinary phrase, these things, it's being used in a very specific way to refer to the Book of Mormon itself. So here are just a couple of examples that you'll recognize. In a Mormon who's ruminating on the future reception of his record, just like Moroni does, he writes that these things are written unto the remnant of the house of Jacob. This is in Mormon 5. And Moroni, who's speaking of the three witnesses prophetically envisioned, confirms that they shall know of a surety that these things are true. Right? This is in Ether 5. Finally, most famously, Moroni concludes the whole record with his well-known exhortation that when ye shall receive these things, I would exhort you that you would ask God, the eternal father in the name of Christ, if these things are not true. It shows up twice there. So these things in the Book of Mormon refers to the Book of Mormon itself, but not in a simple way as a kind of simple accomplished fact or object, like the published volumes that we can all pick up. This is a Book of Mormon. Instead, that phrase, these things, it contains all of that uncertainty, that anxiety, and that weakness, the human contingency that Mormon and Moroni feel about their work. And interestingly, if you look at the 1828 definition of the word things, so the, the sort of lexical world that Joseph Smith would have been working in through his translation, the first definition of thing is not an object at all, but it's an event or it's an action. So these things when it's used to refer to the Book of Mormon, is not so much as a perfect and revered object of authority, as we sometimes tend to think of it, but as an event, the event of its coming forth. For Mormon and Moroni, the essence of the Book of Mormon is its coming forth and the event that it creates in the world. All the uncertainty and anxiety that Moroni feels about how it will be received by the Gentiles and everything that's at stake and unknown in that reception is conveyed in this phrase, these things. So I believe that Moroni carefully shapes the story of the brother of Jared as an allegory for his own wrestle to scripturalize the records that he produces. And remember how much is riding on his success in scripturalizing this, the salvation of the Gentiles and the second coming itself. So um, he does this by building in two significant linguistic clues that suggest that he sees the brother of Jared's manufacture of the 16 stones and their illumination at the Lord's touch as an allegory for his own production of the 16 books of the original Book of Mormon. Remember, it's more an event than an object and it's illumination at the Lord's hand. A divine touch that in that moment transforms it from ordinary text into scripture. 
And as evidence for this, I'm just going to read you two verses. Here we have Ether 3.3, where, um, where the, the moment is being described of the 16 stems. And, and uh, the brother of Jared said, says, Oh, Lord, look upon me in pity. Turn away that anger from his people. Suffer not that they shall go forth across the raging deep in darkness. But behold these things which I have molten out of rock. Touch these stones, O Lord, with thy finger, and prepare them that they may shine forth in darkness, but they will shine forth unto us in the vessels which, which we have prepare, prepared, that we may have light while we cross the sea. Okay, so keep that in your mind. This is how Moroni renders that pivotal moment. Just a few chapters before, in Mormon 8, it's in the Book of Mormon, but it really belongs to me because it's Moroni who's speaking. <laughs> Here is how Moroni describes this moment of the coming forth of the Book of Mormon. The Lord should suffer to bring these things forth, for it shall be brought out of darkness unto light, according to the word of God. Yea, it shall be brought out of the earth, and it shall shine forth in darkness. There's that same phrase, right? Shine forth out of darkness and come unto the knowledge of the people, and it shall be done by the power of God. So he builds these deliberate phrasal correspondences to depict himself as the brother of Jared, who is carefully and painstakingly making these stones, making these plates, and then full of anxiety, full of humility, lifts them to the Lord and asks for his touch to set them aflame, and to transform them into scripture. So if we follow the logic of this episode, what it tells us is Moroni's novel solution to this problem of scripturalization. Because when are the stones actually illuminated? When do they become scripture? After they are made, and immediately before they're placed in the barges. So the process of scripturalization isn't primarily a question of authorial strategies or the other circumstances of the text production. Those are no doubt carefully considered and they, they condition the object that we end up with for sure. But for Moroni, real scripturalization occurs after the production of the text and immediately before it makes its way into the hands of the reader. Scripturalization is a matter of the text's reception. Scripture comes into being not through the extraordinary strength or perfection of its writing, but through the extraordinary faith of its reading. In his famous discussion in Ether 12 of strength and weakness, we can see this psychological drama unfolding in Moroni's soul. His anxiety over the imperfections and weakness of his writing is resolved, or maybe it's just transferred in his insight that the crux of the matter really lies with the Gentiles and their willingness to receive the book faithfully. So here's where I move from a kind of essentially literary or historical mode into what Adam would see as a theological mode. So Moroni eventually arrives at a reader-centered theology of scripture. This um, theology of scripture looks more toward readership to establish scriptural authority than it does toward authorship. The author's work is merely to nurture the scriptural embryo into some kind of written form, while the reader completes its final transformation into scripture in that moment of sincere encounter when she receives it with faith. To be sure, Moroni is still filled with anxiety and trepidation about the power of the book to command the faith that will save the Gentiles and usher in the second coming. But now his anxiety is directed away from himself and instead towards us, right? Towards the modern readers of the book. And when we open the book, will we receive the light that shines forth out of darkness like the 16 stones in the Jaredite barges? A reception theory of scripture <clears throat> treats scripture less as an established deposit of truth that's certified by its authority, right, and more as a field of potential that's ready for the reader to unlock its meaning and its power. For Moroni, the stakes could not be higher. Speaking collectively, the Book of Ether shows that the Gentiles can be saved if they receive the Book of Mormon with faith. And in their salvation, they are to fulfill their role in this grand drama of world salvation by acting as nursing fathers and nursing mothers to the indigenous remnant in the Americas. 
In so doing, the two groups will together bring to pass nothing less than the second coming of Christ. Speaking individually and existentially, each reader's encounter with the Book of Mormon is an opportunity to receive it faithfully and to co-create it with Moroni as scripture. And in so doing, to realize or to make real the next coming of Christ into our own lives. It's a genuine honor to be on a panel with Adam and Rosalind, scholars whom I admire, and they're representative of a set of authors with whom I am deeply honored to be composing this series. And I'm grateful for the chance to share this time with them. I've been inspired by what they've said already to this point. I'd also like to express my love and admiration for Spencer Fluman and for his leadership of the Maxwell Institute. I think this series is indicative of the vision that he has brought to the Institute and the skill with which he executes that vision. I know you're surrounded by a team of people that are helping you establish that vision, but I could not be more grateful for what the Maxwell Institute is under Spencer's leadership and all that it represents. And uh, I'm humbled to be part of this project. I'd like to begin tonight with a personal anecdote from my first really substantive encounter with the Book of Mormon as the work of actual people. I'd often engaged it up until the late adolescence of my life as a kind of theoretical text full of important aphorisms and interesting stories, but I hadn't really thought about the authorial identities behind the text until uh, a day when I was 18 years old and I was living in England where I spent my, the equivalent of my junior and senior years of high school. And I used to frequently go out with the missionaries because I didn't have a life. Um, <laughs> and they knew that on a moment's notice that I would be available. Uh, and there was a missionary serving in our area at the time by the name of Elder Neal from Zimbabwe. The outrageously beautiful accent and I still hear his voice in the back of my head when I remember this experience. We were teaching a man, a BMW motorcycle uh, maintenance uh, mechanic named Nigel, because everybody in England is named Nigel, exactly, but Nigel was named Nigel. And um, Nigel lived just down the road from me, mid-30s, great guy, progressing nicely, and I used to go with the missionaries to, to have these lessons with him. And I remember one night getting a call from Elder Neal. I won't try to redo the accent. Um, but he said Duff, because everybody at that point in my life called me Duff. He said, Duff, um, we can't make it to the meeting with Nigel. We need you to go do it by yourself. I was 18 years old and overwhelmed and intimidated by the prospect of that and a little bit frustrated with Elder Neal. Uh, but I said, what am I going to do? I don't know what to teach. I don't know the discussions. And he said, well, read a chapter of the Book of Mormon with him. I said, well, what do I read? I don't even know what to read. It's kind of panicking at this point. And he said, read Alma 5. I didn't know Alma 5 from Maroon 5. I didn't know what was going on. <laughs> so uh, I, Maroon 5 didn't exist at the time, but I, I, uh, I, went, uh, I went into my living room and I remember picking up a copy of the Book of Mormon and turning to Alma 5 and beginning to read with more energy and intent and fear than I had ever read the Book of Mormon with before. And I heard Alma's voice. I heard what I have come to call an authorial signature in that discourse, a particular way of teaching that sounded different to me from Nephi and sounded different to me from Mormon. It sounded like Alma. And I heard a series of rhetorical questions and I saw a pedagogical style and I saw a rhetorical profile that seemed unmistakable to me. And I just remember sitting on that couch feeling like I was reading a real man's words. And the Book of Mormon has read to me differently ever since that moment. And ever since that moment, I've spent a good deal of time in the Book of Mormon thinking about authorial signatures 
about those rhetorical profiles that make the book what it is. It's a compilation of multiple voices. And it's with that spirit that I came to this assignment to take on the book of Moroni. And I almost immediately was struck by what seems to me to be an authorial signature for Moroni, and that is a preoccupation with both the word and the concept of gift and gifting. If we take, as I do, the title page of the Book of Mormon to be the product of Moroni, it begins with a repetitive reference to the gift and power of God. That is the frame with which he opens the very book itself. If we turn to the last chapter of the book of Moroni and think about the testimony with which he chooses to conclude, is it, about, it is about the spiritual gifts, an abundance, a proliferation of gifts. In beginning and end, this seems to be Moroni's theological and conceptual preoccupation. In fact, if you compare just word frequency, he uses the word gift far more than any other author in the Book of Mormon. Second to Moroni is Mormon. Mormon uses it uh, quite a bit less frequently. That is that Moroni's frequency of usage is, is a far cry beyond his father's. And not only does he use it more frequently, he uses it differently. I'm reminded, actually, when I think about the relationship between Mormon and Moroni on the concept of gift, of something that Bill Moyers, of all people, once said about the role of the media in the public imagination. He said, the media can't tell us what to think, but it can tell us what to think about. And sometimes I think that's a little bit like the relationship between a parent and child. A parent can't really tell a child what to think but she can tell a child what to think about. And it is by her very suggestion that is the topic that's implanted in a child's mind, even as she goes on, the child, to make her own decisions about the content of that topic. Well, here we have Moroni picking up a theme that his father is the second most frequent user of, but doing something very different with it. Um, if you uh, think about the Book of Mormon, the interior Book of Mormon, about which Adam has spoken, and you consider the ways in which they use the word in that book, I'm going to actually just quote from the index because I think the, they're right next to each other in the index under gift in a way that I think is quite striking. So Mormon says about gift that Nephites have no gift from the Lord because of their wickedness. That's in chapter one, the way the Book of Mormon opens. Moroni then concludes his father's book with this charge. He who says there are no gifts knows not the gospel of Jesus Christ. Take that, Dad. <laughs> so this idea that Moroni is often quite pessimistic, Mormon is quite often pessimistic about the squandering of gifts. He actually talks about that repeatedly in the Book of Mormon. And then when he uh, has the discourse on faith, hope, and charity that we know as Moroni 7, he talks about gifts again in a negative sense. He says, those who give gifts grudgingly, it is as if they gave no gift. He's got a kind of pessimism about gift giving. Whereas Moroni is incredibly optimistic. He talks about in ether, in fact, interestingly enough, Ether doesn't ever use the word gift, and when Moroni concludes the book of Ether, he uses it repetitively in the conclusion of that book. He talks about Christ preparing the way for the heavenly gift. He does so at least twice in chapter 12. So in the midst of this destruction and decimation, the pessimism that seems to characterize the squandering of gifts as his father and others have observed it, Moroni retains this hope about the abundance and the power of God's gifts. And I'd like to use just one example of the ways in which I think that manifests itself in the theology of his text. Let's take his teachings on the sacrament, what we know as the sacrament. He actually uses a different phrase for it, which I'll get to in just a minute. So Moroni talks about the sacrament uh, in terms of the prayers that he offers from the time of Jesus to the Nephites. 
And after he introduces those prayers, he then talks about the community that coalesces around those ordinances. And he specifically says that they met together oft to partake of this ordinance. That phrase, the frequency of gathering, I think is our clue to the first gift of the sacrament that Moroni is seeking to convey to us. In fact, that phrase that they met together oft recurs in DNC 20. It is Moroni's phrase imported into modern day revelation to emphasize the importance of the Latter-day Saints taking the sacrament frequently. Did, I'm not much of a mathematician, I guess, because I'm a historian, uh, and there's a real quantitative liability for many of us. But I, I can do the math well enough to know that the average Latter-day Saint who's baptized at eight and lives to about 80 is going to take the sacrament about 4,000 times over the course of their life. It's a remarkable number. 4,000 replications of a sacred ordinance in a person's life. Now, this is actually in pretty stark contrast to other what we might call low church Protestant traditions. Obviously, in Catholicism and high church Anglicanism and other kinds of Christian expression, we see a frequency of communion. But for that sort of low church evangelical Protestantism that would have surrounded Joseph Smith in his day, that's a remarkable number. It's, it's a striking frequency. Actually, this is in uh, keeping with some of the founders of the very theological forces that would have been swirling around Joseph Smith. So John Calvin, actually in ways that his subsequent uh, acolytes have forgotten, advocated very frequent partaking of communion. But because of the uh, intervening theological controversies in Calvinism between the death of John Calvin and the Second Great Awakening in the mid-19th century, Calvinist groups like the Presbyterians uh, or certain kinds of Baptists were taking the sacrament much less frequently, in some cases not even every month. Same thing happens with Methodists. So John Wesley actually advocated, coming out of the Anglican world in which he was formed, actually advocates the frequent partaking of communion. But in the, in the case of the Methodists, it's not a theological controversy, but the pragmatics of getting enough circuit-riding preachers into the congregations enough to give communion frequently. They're, in some cases, only taking it a couple of times a year. So Joseph Smith is not coming up in a theological low church environment where the communion is taking place oft, to use Moroni's term. And yet that concept recurs. Actually, the early states didn't even pick up on this. So there's a whole bunch of sort of uh, soul searching and policy evolution that takes place in the early days of the restoration to figure out how often they're going to take the sacrament. But eventually we come back to Moroni's call. Eventually we come back to that original scriptural dictate to get together frequently and take the sacrament. Now to the tune of 4,000 times over the course of our life. What should we take from Moroni's call to frequency? When I read this, I'm actually brought to mind, uh, I have brought to my mind, a scholar uh, of religious studies, an uh, anthropologist, an ethnographer, named Saba Mahmoud, who wrote a remarkable book that some of you may have read at some point in your life. It's been extraordinarily influential in religious studies. Saba Mahmoud is a Pakistani woman who did ethnographic research in what's known as the mosque movement in Cairo. Uh, what we would see as a sort of um, neo-Orthodox Islamicist movement among women in, uh, in Egypt. And she's looking at these women, she's using sort of existing theories about why people participate in rituals. Why do people go through these ordinances? She thinks about the theories that lots of modern day ethnographers apply, which is that somehow it's a symbolic expression. People are trying to say something to the world when they participate in ordinances. They want to signal a certain kind of identity. And she takes a look at these women who are participating in the rituals of their lives. She says, that's not what they're doing. It's not what this is about. She borrows from the embodied ethics of Aristotle as passed through Michel Foucault. And she says, in essence, they're in the process of forming their very selves. This isn't about what they're signaling to somebody else. This is about who they are becoming for themselves. This is the construction of a pious soul. And so when a Westerner looks at a woman of the mosque movement and says, just take off the veil, it's got too many negative connotations. It implicitly sort of reinscribes your own subjugation. Just take it off. And the woman of the wasp 
Matsuma would say, you're asking me to take off a piece of myself. You're asking me to take off something that has been integral to the formation of my very soul. That when I put that on or when I participate in my prayer rituals, I am in the process of becoming. I'm not signaling. I am becoming. And that requires a frequency. It requires a repetition. It requires a habituation to allow those ordinances to shape our very sense of self. And when a Latter-day Saint shows up on a Sunday morning, week after week after week after week, to the tune of 4,000 weeks, and puts that crust of bread in her mouth or takes that thimble of water into her mouth, she is in the process of becoming. And that is the point. It is the first gift that occurs to me when considering Moroni's discourse on the gifts of the sacrament. But it's not just that. There's also an incredible theological and even ontological substance to those tokens of the sacrament. Shouldn't even use that word. It doesn't quite do justice to what Moroni is saying. Here. So let's take note of the way in which he introduces the sacrament prayer. There's a phrase here that you might easily pass over unless you know something about the environment of the 19th century United States. The manner of their elders and priests administering the flesh and blood of Christ unto the church. He calls it the flesh and blood of Christ. Doesn't call it the tokens of the flesh and blood of Christ. Doesn't say the symbols of the flesh and blood of Christ. He doesn't say the emblems of the flesh and blood of Christ. He said they are administering the flesh and blood of Christ. If you go back to Jacksonian America and you look at invocations of that phrase, the flesh and blood of Christ, it is always in a debate between Protestants and Catholics about transubstantiation. That is, Protestants will invoke that phrase, the flesh and blood of Christ, pejoratively to say this is what Catholics think that they're administering at the altar of the Eucharist. And Catholics will say, guilty as charged. We believe it's the flesh and blood of Christ. And here's a book translated by a low church evangelical Protestant who introduces this ordinance as the flesh and blood of Christ. It's a really arresting phrase. And it's suggests to us that there is a substance to this. I'm not, I'm not making an argument for transubstantiation because the prayers included in Moroni don't go nearly as far as the prayers that a priest offers uh, at the moment of Eucharist and the Mass. So it's a very different kind of prayer, but the substance of it is still there. There is something more than mere emblem, something more than mere symbol that can, in fact, have a transformative effect by its own essential nature. I've been a witness of that. I've seen people healed by the sacrament, spiritually and physical. There's something to it more than just the habituation kind of element that Sapa Mahmoud talked about. And I think it's what Moroni is signaling to in his introduction of it as the flesh and blood of Christ. Moroni could have called it 101 different things. And certainly Joseph Smith, in the process of translating, however you think about the process of translation and however much his own mind and culture may have been the filter through which these words came, either Moroni or Joseph Smith could have called it 101 different things. But they called it what they called it. And I think there's meaning in that. And I think there's promise in that that we too frequently pass over. Because we're not in the chapel, I think I can use an expletive in here, so bear with me for a minute. Um, you, you're probably aware of the, um, of the famous story of Flannery O'Connor, the mid-20th century Catholic novelist who was very committed to her notion of uh, sacramentalism. And she was in an exchange at a cocktail party with another mid-20th century Catholic author, in this case, a lapsed Catholic, who turned to her and said, I always found the Eucharist a healthy symbol. And O'Connor quickly responded, well, if it's just a symbol, then to hell with it. And she was making a point in that exchange that if it's just a symbol, it's not the thing that she wanted to dedicate her life and soul to. Well, the Latter-day Saint, we're going to channel Flannery O'Connor, or if Moroni were going to channel Flannery O'Connor, they'd probably shift that just a little bit to say, well, then if it's only a symbol and nothing but a symbol, then to heck with it. <laughs> <laughs> because we do believe it's also a symbol. And this is the third gift. And this is the gift that I think Moroni concludes with in discussing these prayers. 
Take note of verse 3 of chapter 4, the blessing over the bread. O God, the Eternal Father, we ask thee in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ, to bless and sanctify this bread to the souls of all those who partake of it, that they may eat in remembrance of the body of thy Son and witness unto thee, O God, the Eternal Father, that they are willing to take upon them the name of thy Son and always remember him and keep his commandments, which he hath given them, that they may always have his spirit to be with them. There are two remembrances in there. You probably picked up on this. You've undoubtedly heard this prayer many, many times before. They shall eat it in remembrance. That is, the partaking of it is in and of itself an act of remembrance. It is, a, it is remembering itself, right, in the Saba Mahmud sort of mode. It is, we become remembering people. We become covenant-renewing people in the habituating process of doing this week after week after week. It is substantively a remembrance. But it's also an expression. It is also this, that we witness unto thee, O God, the Eternal Father, that we are willing to take upon us the name of thy Son and always remember him. We are both doing and expressing. It is both substance and symbol. And a symbol, rather than simply being an empty shell into which we can import whatever meaning we want, is in fact the substance of our ability to connect with each other. When Adam and Rosalind were up here conveying to you the extraordinary contents of their minds and the consequences of their readings, they were doing so through symbols, the symbols that came out of their mouth and carried meaning to your minds. It's a beautiful thing to have symbols. They're extraordinary tools of connection. And in the sacrament, we have a symbolic connection with our Father. We convey to him the contents of our heart. We make a promise that we will remember his son always. It expands the vocabulary of our communicative connection with God. And so when a Latter-day Saint is sitting in that pew on a Sunday morning and puts that crust of bread in her mouth or drinks that cup of water, she is sitting at the convergence of three gifts, the abundance of gifts about which Moroni speaks incessantly. She is habituating herself as a covenant-keeping soul. She is receiving the flesh and blood of Christ in a substantive, in a very real sense. And she is expanding her commutative capacity to express to God her determination to remember his son. Not bad for a sacrament meeting. Not bad for a nondescript Sunday morning. Like Moroni, my hope is that we can recognize the abundance of gifts that inhere in even the most quotidian, even the most basic of our church experiences. And I'm grateful for this series that allows us to recognize the abundance of gifts that come through the Book of Mormon. Thank you. Express gratitude to our authors for their work uh, in and in their uh, conveying to us what their, uh, what's in their souls, too. We're going to take a minute now uh, to collect your questions. And so if you'll bear with us for a couple of minutes while we collect them from you, and then while we take a look here, uh, in a couple of minutes I'll stand up again and start uh, giving our questions to our authors. Thanks. Let me first say that there's no way we'll get to all of these. <laughs> this has been one of the painful parts of each of these events is there are far more 
wonderful questions that we can possibly get into uh, and still get you out of here at a decent time. Um, I'm going to start with a question, and I'm going to I'm going to answer partly myself, and then I'm going to invite any of you three that are interested to jump in. The question is a very good one. Why are you choosing to address your theological introductions to each book rather than to treat themes or stories or authors? I think it's a great question. We debated this early on. But part of it was to do justice to what I think David was was getting at, uh, and maybe all three actually were getting at one way or the other, and that is to try and uh, do some kind of respect to authorial voice and the individual experience of those uh, Book of Mormon uh, authors as we understand them. That being said, we did split Alma into two volumes, and we did combine um, uh, a couple of the small books uh, early on. Um, but that, that was the organizing idea. Uh, but I'm interested if you have any other thoughts about what we get out of this when we do it this way. I think, as, as Spencer indicated, it's a way of trusting the Book of Mormon. Part of reading the Book of Mormon is like a dance, and this is a way of letting, Book of, letting the Book of Mormon itself take the lead in the dance, you know, trusting that where it wants to go and the way that it has arranged itself does itself have gifts to offer. <laughs> I've got a couple of you dealing with Moroni, so I'm wondering if you'd be willing to take this one. How did Moroni's long solitude affect him and ultimately his writing? Any thoughts on solitude here and on loneliness <laughs> as an engine for theological insight, maybe? Sure. Uh, sure, yeah. Yeah, so I think um, one way I already alluded to, um, his mind is continually drawn away from the present and towards the future, right? Um, the, the Gentile, whereas for Mormon, um, he's, he imagines, um, he does imagine the future of the Book of Mormon, but he largely imagines its, um, its work among the, the remnant of the House of Lehi, right? So he imagines the remnant Lamanites and their, <clears throat> excuse me, and um, their reception of the book. But on his own, uh, Moroni doesn't have that community. Excuse me. <coughs> So his mind goes to the Gentiles. And I have something in my throat, so excuse me for a moment. Do you have anything? Sure. <coughs> Just a, a second witness to Rosalind. I, I do think it's quite extraordinary how obviously Moroni focuses on community in his moment of isolation. So if you think about the way that the, the, the book of Moroni opens, um, he uh, almost immediately starts talking about the organizing principle of the ordinances. What, what does a well-ordered community look like? What does a community look like when it's got clear instruction and it functions according to God's mind and will? All the things that he has been deprived of over the course of his life. So he's very much fixated on community in, in, in his time of, uh, of isolation. Um, I think there's actually one other element I might underscore here is that at one point in the book of Moroni, he refers to himself in the third person plural as part of a community of sacred authors. So not only does he think of himself as communicating to a community, a future community that he can envision, but he's also created for himself a kind of authorial community. He sees himself in a club, in a group of people who have been trying to write. And there's a real sense in which he's reaching across the divide of his own singularity to give himself a kind of camaraderie with those who have also written before him. I can I'm better now, so I can do. Thank you. That's so kind. 
but just finish my thought. Um, you know, it's really striking in the book of Ether, he, um, Moroni's conversation partner is the Lord, right? So he has these long conversational interchanges with, with the Lord himself. So I think that's one um, effect of his long solitude. Also, I think, you know, when you're alone, it really changes your perception of time. So much of our understanding of normal time is kind of structured by these habitual interactions with the people around us. Um, and, you know, Moroni doesn't, doesn't have that. He's alone so much. So I think, you know, he, he sees, and I work on this in one of the chapters of the book, but he sees these really close correspondences between, for example, the pre-mortal, the, the recently mortal, and the post-mortal appearances of Christ. And he sees the second coming as really closely related, for example, to the brother of Jared's Theophany. So I think time kind of collapses for him in these ways that folds in on itself that I think is, um, is uh, quite likely an effect of his long, his long solitude. The next one's directed to uh, Dr. Miller, but I'm going to invite him to answer, but then either of you two uh, chime in too, if you like. I think this is an exceptionally good question. Uh, I'll, I'll read it and then um, invite you to to think it through, even if you're not a theologian, quote unquote. Dr. Miller spoke about rigor at the beginning of his talk. What is the rigor through which the theologian passes uh, the scriptures? Uh, what's the rigor that the theologian passes the scriptures through? Um, what tools does the theologian have to produce new knowledge? And so whether or not you want to respond as theologian or if you don't want to claim that title we could just stay on the rigor point and and kind of think through what what we might be aiming for when we ask the saints to think along with us in this series Spencer I thought we agreed that we were not going to ask any exceptionally good <laughs> questions I guess not that is a great question. I think part of part of what's involved here uh, in passing life through the fire of thought for the sake of truth, as Emerson put it, uh, part of what's involved there is is the rigor of taking the Book of Mormon seriously at the level of the kind of detail and granularity that uh, that we don't normally use when we, when we read the Book of Mormon. I think a lot of times uh, we recently read the Book of Mormon uh, and hear what we expect to hear rather than simply what it's actually straightforwardly saying. And a lot of the tools that I think uh, an academic discipline supplies you with are tools that prevent you from reading straightforwardly in the way that you would otherwise and simply hearing then in advance what you had already expected to hear. Where a lot of the tools that you get as an academic are tools that force you to move more slowly and to be less certain and to ask more questions. Right? As a philosopher, the kinds of questions that I tend to bring to bear to force myself to slow down might be different than the sorts of questions that, that David would be inclined to bring to bear to force himself to slow down. But in either case, the, the being forced to slow down is a part of what generates the rigor and allows new insights to come to the surface of the text. Uh, in this sense, I wouldn't describe myself as a theologian as producing new knowledge. Uh, that's a pretty bold claim. But I would describe myself as participating as one member of a process of a conversation, of a dance that allows something new to emerge into the light of day with a kind of clarity and force that it wouldn't have had otherwise. And if what emerges into the light of day with clarity and force is Christ, not just as a past phenomenon, but as something that I'm experiencing in the present tense, then I think we've got a bead on what theology is trying to do. So this question fills me with a very Moroni-like anxiety and trepidation because um, I don't, I don't, I'm not really trained um, to be a theologian, but I do want to work in a theological mode in this book, and it's hard. So I, I tried to signal that just a little bit in my remarks. At first, I was 
offering you a reading of Moroni's intent in the book of Ether. And so you can see whether or not I was rigorous there by going back and checking what I said, reading it yourself, seeing does this make sense? Am I persuaded that she is accurately um, and insightfully representing what actually was happening there, right? But for theology, it has a different horizon than that, at least as I understand it. And of course, every author in this series is going to have a different understanding of what theology is. But for me, when I have read theology and I recognize it as theology, it has an effect on me. It changes me personally. And so I can measure whether or not it was successful, not by saying how well does it correspond to what was on, to what's on the page or in the book. That matters, right? And the theologian does not have license to be irresponsible with the text. But there has to be something beyond that. And when um, the works of theology that I have read that have stuck with me are ones that act on me directly. And so the only metric of its success is the way in which I myself am changed. And that's incredibly, it's a little bit like Moroni's dilemma, right? Does what I write have the power to do that? Maybe I need to take Moroni's own advice and say that's going to lie with the readers yourselves when you receive that book. Um, but yeah, so that's how I see the different modes. And I do some of all, I do some sort of literary historical work. I do some ethical work. But ultimately, for me, what I'm excited about, what matters is trying to work in this theological mode that will act on you as a reader. Really very little to add to what Rosalind and Adam have said. Those were beautiful answers about the kind of rigor that I think we're seeking. And they've provided really compelling models of how to do that. Um, I might just shift the vocabulary here a little bit from rigor to uh, critical thinking, which is the way in which I sort of approach the text for the purposes of this series. Uh, we've got a couple of um, uh, students from Theories and Methods in here, uh, uh, Tanner and Emily. So you get your full dose of me this week. Um, but uh, so they've already heard this answer, but I'm really quite struck with the etymology of, of the word uh, critic, criticism, uh, which has to do with a, a root that, ha uh, that implies decision, a point of decision. That is a, a moment at which uh, the story can go different directions. So if you think about um, somebody in critical condition, right, their story can go in different directions. That's the crisis. We're trying to figure out we're at the, we're the moment of decision. And when I come to a text and I think about coming to it critically, and that's a word we get frightened about because we think it assumes a kind of negative assessment or somehow that critical thinking is contrary to faith and testimony. But actually critical thinking is to come at something with the willingness to be led in whatever direction you actually believe the text is leading you uh, and to set aside preconceived mo notions in following its lead uh, and to Adam's point really I, I couldn't agree more with this power of slow reading uh, and the importance of slowing down and allowing that critical element to open you up to the potential that the text is actually offering us, which I think is usually more abundant than we have presumed it to be. I'm going to just take a kind of director's prerogative here, too, and just say that we debated the subtitle for the series for quite some time. We didn't want theological to stop people and get bored already. But we didn't. But it seemed like the right word. Uh, a little etymology here too on theology. You know, God talk. <laughs> Reason to talk about God is where we ended up. What we were, what we wanted to signal in particular was what we were not trying to do, and that is declare official doctrine or speak authoritatively for the church, which isn't our purview at all as scholars. That's not the space we inhabit. So we steer away from something like doctrinal or a, do, you know, a doctrinal introduction or something like that. We want to signal that we're, we're, we don't speak authoritatively. We're not the ones to declare official doctrine for the church. And so we wanted to ramp down from that since that's not our space. But at the same time, we, we hope theological conveys something about our own commitments as well, that this isn't 
um, work of intellectual abstraction for its own end, but that it was implicated in our own discipleship as well, that as authors and editors, we're not in some way outside the pursuit of holiness, looking on it as a kind of object to study. And we're in it. We're implicated in it. And so we're, that's what we're trying to convey in that language, whether or not it comes through. I don't know. We're, keep, we're, <laughs> we're, we're still working on it. A related question, and if it's too close to the other one, just shake your heads and we'll move on. Uh, and we're getting close to time. I realize we're over just a little bit. What is theology's proper place? Is the question. Home, school, Sunday school, etc. How should we as a community think about this reason to God talk that exists with, but is not the same thing as prophets and apostles authoritatively, authoritatively declaring doctrine, but as Latter-day Saints, as neighbors, friends, folks in the pews, what is theology's place? I'm, I'm expanding a little bit on the great question, whoever wrote it. Thank you. Go ahead. Sure. <laughs> I think it's important to have a place uh, in our community, in our tradition, for thinking as carefully as we're able about the things that matter most to us uh, with the kinds of rigorous tools that different academic disciplines offer, that there's a kind of contribution that can be made there. When I think of myself as a, as a philosopher, as a theologian working on topics related to my own religious tradition, I tend to think of myself as a kind of farmer. It's my job to plant things and see if they grow. Uh, and then it's our job as a community, as a tradition, to see what among those things that grow might be worth keeping and replanting. Uh, it's not my job to decide what the community should or shouldn't keep or do or not use or not use, but it is my job to help provide raw materials for the community to, to think about itself, uh, to care for itself, uh, and to uh, extend the reach of the power of the things that it's uh, called to uh, safeguard. Uh, and so I think there's I think there's a real place and a real role for that. It's not a role that decides. It's a role that shares and prepares and uh, lets the community decide, see what grows, and then let the community see what what they like to eat. So, so the question was uh, at home at school. At Sunday school, I don't remember all the options yeah. of where we use theology. Yeah. I would just make the case for all of the above. Um, I really do think that careful thinking about God and about our relationship to him has its place everywhere all the time. I, you know, the, 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 across this church, people have been using Adam's letters to a young Mormon as a kind of theology that applies in lots of different places. I've used it with my kids. Uh, and I've used it for myself. And so we have models out there of how this kind of careful theological reasoning can actually apply in just about every area of our life. And you've got panelists on, on tonight's session that have already exemplified how that might look. Okay, final question. It's a great one. Prompted, I can only imagine, by the devastating beauty of Dr. Miller's apocalypticism. <laughs> what? <laughs> Can't even read it now. <laughs> what hope or optimism do you find in the Book of Mormon? <laughs> so, <laughs> I think this is a great place to end for all three of you, please. Uh, <laughs> Please think through. Uh, in, in, a, in a way, I think it's a, I think it's a beautiful question because it relates to. Uh, I think in just a half second of reflection, I, I told her that I knew it had to be our last one. But what a what a what a world we love and mourn over. The world of 2019 is a is a thing to behold and to mourn over, and uh, hope or optimism that you find in the Book of Mormon. All three authors, please. Mormon 
describing himself in Mormon circles back to the same adjective repeatedly. He describes himself uh, as sober and quick to observe. When he tries to give some kind of explanation for why, as a teenager, he is personally visited by Christ, the only explanation he can come up with is that single word, that he is sober. If there's a kind of optimism that we should learn to uh, mirror in our own lives from the Book of Mormon, I think it's that kind of sober optimism recognizing that the work of being optimistic starts with doing the really difficult thing that Mormon is so good at doing, which is observing the end of the world, being willing to look in the eye the fact that the things that we love and the people that we care for and the work that we do is passing away. That if there's grounds for joy and transformation, it's not in being spared the work of sacrificing all things, but in willingly taking up that work of sacrificing all things. If we had some kind of hope, some kind of optimism that we could save our lives without losing them, the Book of Mormon is not the place to find it. If you have some hope, some hope or optimism that it is possible to save your life, if you're willing to lose it, the Book of Mormon is for you. For Moroni, his hope for salvation is in our learning to love and to trust and to have faith in the weak things and the flawed things, whether that be the Book of Mormon um, or whether it be our experience with God in the world. Have you ever wondered in the in the experience of the brother of Jared where uh, he, you know, he holds up the stones to the Lord. The Lord reaches out and touches them. And the brother of Jared is absolutely thrown back. He collapses to the ground. And um, the Lord says, why have you fallen down? Or, you know, get, stand up. And, um, you know, he says something interesting. He says, it's because um, I thought you might smite me. And, and this is interesting. I've thought about this a lot. Um I wonder whether that's really what scared Moroni. Maybe what scared Moroni, sorry, Brother Jared, you can see how, seriously, I'm taking my reading. Maybe what, what frightened the brother of Jared is that the Lord has a finger, right? A finger is small. A finger is weak. It was the same finger, we're told, the same body in which the Lord visited the Nephites. The brother of Jared has approached the Lord asking for deliverance in their migration across the sea. He's depending on the Lord's ability to rescue them and redeem them. And the Lord comes to him in the weak, human-scale body of a person. And when he extends his finger, it's a human-sized finger. Maybe it was that that set the brother of Jared back on the ground and shook him to the core. But he was able to exercise faith, nevertheless, in the things that are weak and the things that are flawed. So I do think that Moroni has hope for salvation, but it depends on our being able to love and to embrace and to accept uh, that which is weak and that which is flawed. Rosalind and I must be working on the same guy um, because that's very much in keeping with what I intended to say, just said better. Um, let, let me just know that I have this theory that Moroni gets to end the book because he's the optimist of the bunch. And that's the note on which the book is supposed to conclude. It's not a naive optimism. He's seen the worst that this world can offer. But in that, he sees an opportunity for growth. I've always been struck and, and Rosalind's alluded to these passages, 
at the end of the uh, interior book of Mormon, condemn me not because of mine imperfection, neither my father because of his imperfection, neither them who have written before him, but rather give thanks unto God that he hath made manifest unto you our imperfections, that you may learn to be more wise than we have been. Even in his recognition of the fallenness and brokenness of the authors of the Book of Mormon, he finds reason for hope for a future generation. And then, perhaps his most famous line of hope, Wherefore, whoso believeth in God might with surety hope for a better world, yea, even a place at the right hand of God, which hope cometh of faith, maketh an anchor to the souls of men, which would make them sure and steadfast, always abounding in good works, being led to glorify God. Thanks again uh, to our authors for uh, sharing with us. Thanks to you for being here. We'll conclude with a word of prayer and then uh, let you come and greet authors as, as you'd like. Uh, more information about this series can be had at mi.byu.edu slash brief, where you can track uh, how the series is progressing and uh, and when you can re when you are able to read along and think along with these great hearts and minds of these uh, wonderful authors. Uh, our closing prayer tonight will be given by uh, Ryan Tobler, a graduate student at Harvard Divinity School. Ryan, thank you. Our Father in Heaven, we're thankful to have been here this evening and to have had the opportunity to uh, hear this sister and our brothers uh, reflect on our keystone scripture and for the um, intensity with which they've considered it and the, uh, the, the insight that they've gained from it and shared with us. We're thankful for the opportunity to participate in uh, that discussion. We pray for... Um, that that will sustain our, our curiosity and help us to choose our questions and guide us in the ways that we think that we can be, we can worship thee with our, our minds as well as our souls and bodies. We're thankful for um, the resources and the, uh, and the opportunities that we have, that we have the scriptures that we have. Um, uh, in, in many ways, the, the leisure to reflect and think and deepen our, our testimony. Uh, we pray for uh, we pray for strength in discipleship and uh, in faith. We pray that we will be uh, able to strengthen our faith through our through our thought and deliberation and consideration and pondering. And we say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I'm <laughs> <laughs>